So I know Pat, Dutch, and Jamie, all from Special Operations, we all used to work together. Uh, and really the beauty is I think once we've all kind of retired, we've come back together, we all help each other out. Uh, we've done collabs together with uh, Dutch and Pat. I know Dutch and Jamie have worked together. That's cool, that's what you see at car shows. You yeah. know, you yeah. go there, the hood's up, they got the book put there, it out, like put it everything out there. original. Get the easel out there. Yeah. So what kind of bourbon do I like the most? That's, uh, that's a tough question. It's like, uh, what's your favorite book or your favorite movie? I like all kinds of bourbons. Pat Mack, Rick Hogg, Dutch, bunch of great guys. We've known each other for years. We've worked together, we've deployed together, we've been through thick and thin together. Yeah, Very sexy nice, beast. Man. She is sexy. a beauty. When we race. <laughs> that one's faster, <laughs> this one's cooler. <laughs> so I am relatively new to the world of bourbon. Probably seven, 10 years into it right now. So I don't have a lot of experience, but I have pretty good taste. <coughs> Hold on. <laughs> so this is our this is our barrel our barrel strength bourbon. This is 115 proof. This is what we want. This is what we want here. So all, all that means is that when we take it out of the barrel to proof it down, we add less water. That's all proof is. Wow. Don't be shy. If you want, if you want more me, freedom, finger, just let me know. That's good. I'm not shy at all. I just don't want to see that car on one of those Instagram things later. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's leaving the now driveway the said, and wrecks him. My them. wife already said she'd come pick me up. Holy crap, man, the difference is night and day. Yeah, so you, I mean, obviously it's hotter, as we were talking yep, about earlier. a little bit, but, uh, but nutty? You're gonna, you're gonna get a lot more flavor. Right. Mm -hmm. because what am I, what, what am I, what's the nuttiness I'm tasting? I'm, I, I got some kind of nuttiness. Yeah, I mean, listen, every, everyone's palate's gonna be different. Yep. Yep. Depending on, you know, what huh. you have for dinner, what you have for breakfast, right. hydration levels. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when people come in to the distillery, uh, and you get this being a connoisseur, people say, how should I drink bourbon? And I tell them, any way you want. However you want, You want to drink it with yep. Coke? Have at it. You want to, Whatever you with want. With a straw, a gun carry glass straw, with a straw? Yeah. A straw is a good idea. But the old, what, what does get me is when I, I'm sitting at the bar and I do order oh, and they have water. they have a nice collection and then you got the guy that comes up and orders you know, a very high-end bourbon and then wants to mix it with something. Cool. Yeah, but you know what? It, it still all, gets I, me. I, I mean, I can see, I like, I like <laughs> ice in mine. Some people are all neat. Sure. But when you, but to me, the history behind bourbon, how much effort goes into, and all those different oh, yeah, unique flavors, everything you get out of the oak barrel, that's what, like, just like you said, gives it all the color, gives it all the flavors. You're not enjoying any Don't of that. Don't ruin now, it. When you throw but, Coke in there, you throw mm. lemonade or, you so know. So you're a bourbon snob. I but, guess but so. It's not, if you want to, if you want to say it, sure, my, I'll take no, that. No, I, I tend to agree with you, but you my know? attitude is, if that's the way you like to drink it, oh, you're no, no, 100%. It. I'm but I say anybody. appreciate it. I, I hear you. Now hear you. there are times, sure, I'll you know, just like this, I'll mm. drink it neat. I want to taste it, especially a new bottle, and then all right, throw some cubes in there, mm. you know, let it sit and just sit and enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I mean, nothing wrong with a good old fashioned. I do enjoy so, a sure. good old fashioned, so I, but I'm not going to make it with. Yep. <laughs> Pappy Van Winkle, <laughs> you know? I mean. I tell you, I, I used to be a neat or a one ice cube drinker. I love drinking old fashions. Mm. They're nice, they're fun. It's just, they're a little foo-foo, bro. Yeah, but I mean, no, come on. but hold on. Listen, if someone gives you <laughs> a, a Shirley <laughs> Temple cherry in your old fashioned, yep. you send it back. Yeah, right. You give, you, you, you use Luxardo cherries. Are you a Luxardo cherry fan? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. But I tell you, first of all, Manhattan's, if you're a gin drinker, Negroni's, sure. Old Fashioned's, it's still all alcohol. So it's, yep. it's not like you're drinking mm -hmm. rum and coke. But I just, it, it's, if for someone that's getting in, it's afraid of brown liquor, yeah. uh, an Old Fashioned or a Manhattan is a great way to, Completely to get concur. them. In. Great way to get them. And I love them. Sazerac? Yeah. Hey, uh, how unusual is that, though? You get people uh, because absinthe is one of the key ingredients in a really good sazerac, and so many pubs don't carry absinthe. Yep. Uh, Pernod is a good substitute, but yeah, it's it's not the way to go. You gotta have absinthe. So he's way more of a bourbon geek than I thought. Yes. Yes. All right, so that's why I don't have that's any absinthe why, in my I, in my in my. That's cabin. why we you should get some. <laughs> we can make a good sazerac. What started out as a weekend hobby has become now a burgeoning full-time job for me. 
We are currently in 23 states and Canada. Uh, we bought a old beef farm in upstate New York, in Stamfordville, New York in 2010. Uh, ran a small bourbon distillery out of a barn. Uh, in 2015, we upgraded everything substantially. Uh, I, I was very, very fortunate to hire a young distiller out of Buffalo Trace. Uh, and ever since then, we've had the wind at our back. How long have you been doing this? How, talk to why Taconic, and how long have you? Oh been yeah, doing? yeah. Taconic. So we've been doing it. So we started selling bourbon in New York in December of 2013. So we've had a good run. I would say, uh, in terms of a business, we certainly weren't early, but we certainly weren't late, and have definitely caught the wave. I mean, it's it, it really took off to the point where. I am working full time. We've got, you know, 20 something employees. We're in 23 states and Canada. And it went from a hobby to a legit commercial enterprise. That's great. Um, we're right off the Taconic State Parkway that is a huge north south divider in New York. Um, we've got the Taconic Mountains. Taconic is also an old Indian name spelled completely different. But I wanted to keep the kind of Hudson Valley Taconic geography. So that's what we went with that name. Cool. Yeah. Super cool. And, it, and it's worked out well. I would say the most important thing that we've done in this business, which, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get, um, but was having a dog on the label. Right, the dog. I mean, I had, I was not a marketing guy in college. This dog will sell more bourbon than I ever will. That's funny. Hmm. And this is a, it could be a lot of dogs, but when people, if, you're, if you were a dog uh, nerd, uh, the tail would give it away. It's an American foxhound. Oh, right on. So, I was going to say it's like a walker a, or something. But, it could yeah. be. I mean, a, you know, wine mm -hmm. or German short here, but it's the tail that gives away. All the yeah. other dogs have clipped tails. Uh, and the, the history of the foxhound goes back to prohibition because if you ever hear hounds, they, they don't bark, they howl. Right. So that, that, that sound seems to carry a lot further than a bark, and they were used by bootleggers uh, as, as a... Early warning. Know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, way back when. So I just I'm, had you add yeah. a splash of water just to flavorized. the cast strength, and I know it opens it up. Man. Oh, it does. Oh yeah, it, it really without does. a doubt. When you put bourbon in a glass and then you add water to it, it actually changes it. It's a Oops, physical, it's a it's a physical mm -hmm. thing that does change, and it's mm -hmm. a science. Yep. So if you believe in science, you have to believe in science. <laughs> Sounds pretty sciencey to me. Right? Correct me if I'm wrong. On average, you're losing thirty percent. All right, all right. So, so to get out of your so, barrels. So, 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 all right. So to talk, we'll talk about angel share. So when you put, when you fill those barrels, and we fill, we, we use 53 gallon barrels. You yep. fill those suckers, 53 gallon barrels. And we, we fill them at 125 proof, the, 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 the max you can do. If I were to check that barrel three weeks later, the proof has plummeted, maybe 122 proof. What happens is all the moisture in the wood goes into the barrel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your proof goes down. Every single day going forward, right. the proof goes up because you're losing molecules of water. In the first year, we will lose about, say, 10%. And then every year after that, it's, it's you know, call it 4 to 8% on a mm -hmm. bell curve. Good call. So that's referred to as the angel share. That's, mm -hmm. I knew that, yep. Oh, okay, right, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the angel yeah. share. So the other thing is, five years later, we dump a barrel. So a new, uh, uh, an empty barrel is 115 pounds. You fill the sucker up, it's probably 520 pounds. So I'm not really worried about anyone stealing these things because it's not easy. <laughs> right. It's safety, you got to be careful. So we'll dump a barrel four and a half years later. The barrel will weigh about 135 pounds. Huh. And I should have brought a stave because you see, you right, know, right, if right. you will see the char, but then you see a little, you know, brown line in there. Mm -hmm. And that is alcohol that stays in the wood. And that's referred to as the devil's cut. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we take a barrel, it only works in the winter. If I take a barrel, bring it inside, get it to 70 degrees, whatever, dump it out, empty it out, and then throw that barrel outside when it's 30 degrees for a couple days. Mm -hmm. Two or three days later, I'll be able to get another cord out because of the wood contracting. Yep. Okay, so Beam Centauri did this cool little shtick of the Devil's Cut, and it started selling large, you know, copious amounts of bottles from Jim Beam, Devil's Cut. But yeah. it's, it's a shtick more than anything. There's no I, way. I would say it's more a marketing gimmick. Of course I mean, it is. Because it's a great to, idea. to get a lot of it, a large scale is a lot of work. Yeah, that's yeah, not it's happening. A lot of work. No. It's a lot of work. So there's some blended. There's some. In there's yeah, some, some in there. In there's addition to that, though. In addition but I, but to I'm willing to bet if you could just do pure Devil's Cut, it'd be fantastic. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, I am a born and bred New Yorker. We bought the, the place up there primarily to use for hunting and shooting before the distillery was even an idea. Uh, and one of my goals, there are several distilleries in New York, but one of my goals is in the next decade to make New York bourbon relevant. 
know what I, I I really dig about Dutch is when we do we collaborate, right? So we've all collaborated. I've collaborated with all these guys in choruses. But uh, at the end of a training day, we do a tailgate, you know, when when Dutch is there. We do a tailgate, Ooh, man. Yeah. We sit on the tailgate. He always brings a couple bottles, talks about them, goes through the nuances, and, you know, don't drink the freaking Kool-Aid. And it's like out of an aluminum cup or something like that, you know? And <laughs> Whatever you have available. Whatever, yeah, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, whatever exactly, you have available. Man. But it is badass, man. I freaking dig that. You know, right there on the range, everything's done. We've cleaned everything up. Mm-hmm. Let's chew the fat, talk some shit, reminisce about freaking... Dudes, I appreciate that. That that that, that dude, that is freaking rich, man. Uh, I you, really freaking like that, and I am one of these. I'm a sappy fucking dude, like you are. You know, I I get verklempt and I am mushy. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, but here's the thing, Mac. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna caveat on that. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, right? Be- yeah. Because the key part is, it's mm. we've all got things we're dealing with, and it's yeah. passing it on to the next generation. Because right. we yeah. grew up in the age, you don't cry. You don't show emotions. You don't do anything. Right. Go Fuck that. I cry like well, a baby. Well, <laughs> but here's here's my point. There's still a, a lot of people out there that's in that same boat, mm-hmm. and to sit there and go, uh, uh-uh. uh, show yourself. You know, here's the thing, and I think you hit a key point. It, it's remembering the guys that aren't here anymore. Yep. And, and that's why I always caveat, dude. Why do we take selfies all the time? Just because. Because I've got. I don't have pictures of people that aren't here. Yeah. yeah. I we haven't. Were talking earlier. Yeah. We were talking earlier about it, yeah. right? There are some key people in my life I don't have pictures with. We've been to yeah. courses before where I'll, t- I'll ask the dudes in the course, I'll say, hey, who's the youngest? Yeah. Do you hang, do you hang out with them? No, why? we don't hang out. I go, why don't you hang out with them? Yeah. yeah. Why, why don't you get to know each one of you guys? Dude. Yeah. Now, some of them yeah. come from conglomerates. Right. So sure. So I get it. There, yeah. there are different units that touch each other or right. don't. The but, last course that we just did, Dutch and I together down in mm-hmm. Georgia, was over Memorial Day weekend. Oh, oh. shit. And we did, mm. we did a deal by the flagpole, mm-hmm. and Dutch represented because there was four of us unit yeah. members that were instructors there, and a coal conglomerate of, of JTACs, PJs. We had a bunch of the Air Force Special Operations guys that we Tired were there Ranger. teaching. Yeah, mm-hmm. Rangers, yep. unit, a whole conglomerate of guys. I mean, I don't know how many guys were on that flagpole, and Dutch has the list, mm-hmm. and we labeled off everybody that we've lost. Yep. You know, and it was, I, dude, it was I awesome. I do that every but, Memorial Day. Yeah, yeah. but, it but was I think absolutely awesome. Man. But I think with Dutch's Thanks, list, bro. you've got some four legged friends in there as well. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's the other part that people don't get. Yeah. So when we're looking at the circles we run in, yeah, you know, trust me, we, we remember, and I think, Mac, you hit it this year. Yeah. And it's been kind of a pivotal point for me. We remember our two legged, you know, mates. Mates. Yep. But we're not our four legged. And especially yep. for those of us that have run one of those little bastards, right? Yep. Uh, that, and I think we've all had our asses saved by those little guys. Shit. They are yep. a combat multiplier like nobody oh, yeah. can, nobody understands. Now there's 26 yeah. names on that wall, or more, I think it's 26 right now, but there's 26 names on that wall, and if they weren't there, there'd be more two-leggers on the wall. Mm-hmm. Yep. When Valco died in 2005, without a doubt, he saved three or four dudes. Yep. And I, I would submit to you that every time one of those, one of the 26 four-leggers died, at least one or two dudes were saved it, it, because at, of that. at a minimum. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, and that's the part is you don't know. Each one's a little different. A what deal. happened? Oh, hell yeah, it's a big deal. Big deal. And, and that's the part that you keep that lineage going. You know, so yes, we remember our mates that we've lost. Yeah, he, has, he has allowed us to harness the power of the four-legged mm-hmm. partner and enabled him to help us save lives without mm-hmm. him. Yeah. I'm going to get for Klimt here in a second. No, 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 no. Holy I'll crap. Just, I, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but yeah, but that's you. my mom. No, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you from getting for Klimt. No, 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 no. But no, no <laughs> but this might exacerbate the situation too. But yes, my Memorial Day ritual is I sit by a fire, I grab a bourbon, and I write down every freaking dude, you know, from memory that I have. And the list, you know, it's, it's pretty long. It's daunting. But I do not mourn their deaths, but I celebrate their lives. Celebrate their Mm -hmm. lives. And I'll tell a story about each freaking dude, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and usually laugh my ass off with a tear in my eye, but you know. Yeah, on Memorial Day around that flag in Blakely, I said the exact same thing. We don't we don't mourn these uh, men's death. We thank God that they live, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
it's just, again, this is the small percentage of people who are willing to sacrifice and give the last full measure to their country yeah. and, and their partners. Yep. So, yep. That's and what we all signed up for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it yeah. comes down to. And I, I mean, I had to sit down because after Joe's death and everything we went through, mm -hmm. you know, I had three sisters. Joe had a handful of sisters yep. and, you know, different things we went through. And I mean, I, I remember sitting down with my sisters and just saying like, look, this is what I signed up for. This mm -hmm. is what I wanted to do. You know, yeah. if something happens to me, understand that I went out doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, celebrate that. Like, yeah. Don't mourn it. Don't nothing. Like, this is what I wanted to do. Sure. So Christmas Eve, towards the end of our rotation, you know, and a lot of times that's, that's kind of when things go awry is we're winding down, ready to go. I mean, this target popped up and it was one of those that's, well, do we go, do we not? You know, we're already kind of partly packing up. I think our, our relief had already come in, so the next squadron was in, getting ready to replace us. And, you know, we're like, ah, let's, you know, we'll go ahead and jump on this one. And it was, you know, quite a few things that happened throughout the night. I mean, number one is we're watching on ISR, we could see that they were up and about. You know, two in the morning, they were still up, moving around, so we knew that they were awake. And normally we like to come in, you know, this one we had to come in and helo in, but we like to land, you know, we call it on the X. So we land right there and just get on them as quick as we can. And unfortunately, that was the plan, but once we got there, we couldn't do that. So we, my team ended up fast roping infill and into, so you don't see this often, but into somebody's like high fenced backyard, which is a rarity over there. So we got stalled there having to kind of land on what we call the Y. And then we landed in somebody's backyard, had to cut our way out. So we had to get bolt cutters, cut the locks, get out, start running up the road, and then cut the gate that goes up to that house. And as we were, as we were going up to the house, uh, it was myself, I was a 2IC at the time, and my team leader, we were running up there to, you know, to go into the breach, and we saw the guy silhouetted in the doorway, and you could see like there was a little bit of backlight, and um, we immediately saw you know, the AK rack on him, and we were like, well, this guy's ready to fight. There's no sense in you know, running right in there, so we kind of just kicked down a little notch and slowed down our pace, so we weren't gonna just run in there. Well, Joe is fairly new, uh, kind of a young guy, and I, I feel like you know he saw an opportunity to pass up a team leader and a 2IC and be number one going in there. He came blowing by us, and I looked at my team leader and we were like, oh crap, you know, and we picked up and we were right on him, but you know he went right into the breach, the guy saw us come and ended up backing into a corner and just slinging AK rounds through the door. It was only four of us that got through the initial breach. I mean, it was just AK rounds coming right out of the front door. Joe went in, my team leader went in, I went in, and one other guy got in, and that was it. Everybody else was stuck outside. Our medic got hit coming up the driveway. Um, another guy that took post in the door took a hit, you know, in, in his uh, laser on his gun, which exploded into his face. He took shrapnel. Um, my team leader, as I came in and we cleared that first room and Joe went into the first room with the guy, uh, I got immediately on him and we started going into that room, you know, that all these rounds are coming out of, but Joe was in there. So we started going in, my team leader got hit and kind of fell back. And, um, you know, I, I went around him to look because my first instinct was, whoa, I, I've never seen him hesitate. You know, it was like something serious if he just hesitated going into a room, but it was because he got hit. So he got hit, um, fell back. I came around him and um, I saw Joe laying there on the floor. And it was one of those where, you know, you have to make that split second decision of, do I try to just engage with this guy and shoot and get in there? And there was n nobody else with me, you know, or just go in there and go after Joe. So I ended up dropping my rifle and somebody was posted up outside the door shooting rounds in there and I just kind of ducked under the rounds coming in and going out and just grabbed Joe and, you know, and drug him, drug him into that, back into that next room. Luckily, I, I, you know, didn't get hit. I had some rounds come off my kit, but, you know, luckily I, I didn't get hit in that instance, but uh, Joe wasn't as lucky. Joe got stitched up pretty good and, you know, we worked on him. The medic that got shot in the arm coming up the driveway, he got in the house and we had to pull him off of Joe because he was just working on Joe and he's spewing blood himself, you know, but that's, that's the mentality there. It's, it's, uh, you know, that's that brotherhood and, and 
what we do. You know, you, you, you do everything you can. You put yourself in harm's way to save your brother, and they're gonna do the same thing for you. But it, was, uh, it wasn't a great night, um, but that's what we sign up for, and you just deal with, the, you deal with the after effects later on after it's all said and done. God, you know, is, speaking of uh, good Thurman amazing. stories, remember we were talking about talent, unit guys and talent, yeah. you know, just a few hours ago in the garage. You know, do you know James, a professional bass fisherman? Yeah, no, I know. I saw, uh, he he was on University of Badassery, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, where I saw yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I imagine that, retiring from the Army and becoming a professional freaking bass fisherman. <laughs> that was my retirement plan. Dude, Because, that is, that I mean, is, like most guys, man. it's right. not. <laughs> no. Even though what we did in the unit and everything that we do, it's not your every day. Like for me, it was a nine to five job. Yep. You know, I, I gave it my all 110% while I was there, but when I left, it was like, okay, we, we, nothing going on today. All right, well, and I'm going to the lake and I'm going fishing. I enjoyed it. I grew up fishing. And when I, well, it really started when I got stationed in Savannah, Georgia at 175. Yep. I was fishing locally and somebody said, hey, you need to join a bass club. Mm -hmm. And this is like the mid nineties. I'm like, what's a bass club? Never heard of it. You know what I mean? I grew up in New England. So I, I grew up in, in Connecticut and fishing, you know, grew up fly, fly fishing, fishing, just like Max. So mm -hmm. used to fly fish a lot and uh, took up bass fishing when I got down South, but ended up joining a bass club. And then it was an instant, just it, this is for me because you're racing boats it's money, it's competition, you know, limited time. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like, it's an adrenaline rush. Yeah. You have groupies? And I loved it on bass fishing. Yeah, yeah. Eh, no groupies? There's some that follow me, yeah, but it's not, you know, not like the tactical side. But, but I, that was my retirement plan. Yeah. So as I got closer to retirement, just started growing the sponsors. And I had some great people in the industry that I'm still great friends with today. And I, matter of fact, yesterday I missed dinner last night. I apologize, but I was just coming back from Texas from the Bassmaster Classic. Yep. You know, so the it's- The Bassmaster Classic, bro. That's no small fries. Yeah. Uh, that's not small fries. Where was it? In oh, no. Uh, that's, that's, it was on that's Ray big, Roberts. Like, like, what's your go-to lure? Oh, man. So fly fishing, it's the either the San Juan worm or the woolly booger. No, hell no. <laughs> what, what's yeah. yours? No. Mine? It depends. It, it's twofold. Am I fishing to angle or am I fishing for food? Angle. Because next angle. week I'm going to Montana. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm fishing for food. Yeah. So, so I'm using worms? a bead head. Okay. Yep. Yeah, whatever's yep. going to catch like the a, most. Like a number 18 bead head. Yep. Yeah, because I Bring those reading glasses. Yep. <laughs> my, 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 <laughs> lady, Not, my lady's reading glasses. The, my Plano case. Yes, it's this, badass. So fish, my fishing, I, I go into my fishing tackle stuff, <laughs> yep. right? And I grab a water, you know, an airtight, watertight box. Get my cigars in there, put a little cedar chips. And badass. I got my, yep. That's got your works, human. man. Yep. It works. Yep. Where's, like, where's why spend hundreds of dollars on a humidor where's the logo when, the logo when a sponsor the logo? hooks you up yep. with watertight, airtight? Watertight, airtight. Yeah. Tight ass. Digging it, bro. boom, that's it, man. But Jamie, tell yeah. me the logo of that thing, man. It's like, What's hey, a, where's my logo, logo on Yeah, it? where's my logo? I need, I need a one minute out logo on this thing. I have a sticker that can accomplish that. Yep. There you yeah. go. But yeah, man, that's, this is my humidor now, right, right. there. And it's cool, because I can see through it. I see when I'm like, oh, I need to go buy some more cigars. You're like, right now. I drank this like it was bourbon. I need some more. Every time I go like to Montana, I, I go every year, right? I like it. So I, in the military, we packed a ruck our entire lives. You never get it right. <laughs> you know, it's never perfect. Uh, but one of the things I always screw up is how much bourbon am I going to take with me? And because they make plastic flasks, you know, and I'm always short. So I have a plastic <laughs> flask, you take it off and it's got a shot glass right there. Yeah. So you can just sip on it. <laughs> but I try to go with Lewis and Clark rules, you know, two gills a day. Because <laughs> they had, you know, so on the core of uh, Discovery, they had whiskey rations every day. That was one of the things they were adamant about bringing with them was uh, whiskey. And I, I imagine it was sense. just pr absolutely freaking swill. Had to be, you know, but. Uh, but uh, What did they do in Shackleton? Uh, alcohol or no? Oh, hell yeah, bro. Yeah, 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 yep. Uh, but, you know, as far as that last tour, the endurance tour, man, they ran out of everything real yeah. fast. Yeah, yep. they ran, and there was supposedly, <clears throat> there was still scotch left on the endurance when she, when she was crushed. Yes, mm -hmm. and his first time there, he cached a bunch. Yep, mm -hmm. and it was rediscovered, I think, in the 90s. Well, I know you talked about this crap on your blog and all that, but I'm telling you, that's one of the 
to me, just as a, I love the survival thing. I yep. love survival aspects of all things, but I love the extremes, and that's just one of the greatest stories. Uh, Which, greatest stories of uh, failure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. pro. Failure, Dude. and yet success, because they, they lost no, no one. one. Right, yeah. Uh, how long do they live? On the ice flows of the Arctic, right, right, and yeah, and, then, yeah. And, and, and in total darkness yeah. and always cold, always wet, always hungry. Oh yeah, for 14, always. 15 months. months. Mm -hmm. No Gore-Tex, no. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So when, no Patagonia. Go back to that. So go back to that. So think about that. Once winter, they made okay. the almost impossible <laughs> yeah. journey from Elephant Island to the mainland of uh, Georgia, of South Georgia, Georgia right? Island. So six hundred miles. And a, on a life raft a, with a makeshift a, a sail. And then in the bullshit right to the and, and navigating with a yes. sextant yes. over freaking heavy seas yes. through the clouds. Keep going. Uh, you get so Bro, are you freaking so kidding me? Come on. And then <laughs> when they get there, yeah. When they get there. They get to the wrong side. They get to the wrong side. When they, they get, get to there, the windy they side. They have, climb, freaking they have to climb up. Yes. And all they have is hemp rope. Hemp rope. They had like 20 feet of freaking hemp rope. So one axe. Paul brought it up, right? Clothes that were completely mean? freaking yep. in, in, yep. in, in uh, shambles. Going. And now they had to climb over this freaking island. They had and to hump over. Down the mountain. It was, <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't that far in perspective. But, but here's, they're starving. Right. But They've had no sleep. And they can't go to sleep because if you go to sleep, you're going to die. You're going to die. So wait. So go back to Paul's point. So yeah. let's go back retro. Right. Paul said, wait, no Here. Gore-Tex? No, no nylon ropes? Nope. So in the 80s, a group of men did the same thing and they failed. Right. Uh, 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 it was the fifties. Wow. A group of men who 50s. were experienced mountain climbers. You sure, it was fifties. Yes. Yep. They 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 went ahead and remapped and rewalked yeah. that and, and failed. Yes, and they failed. And then when Shackleton you, and his couple dudes did it with freaking nothing. Go back to your sleep thing. So they go up there. Yep. And they're all gonna die. Oh right. And they all went sleep. Yep. And Shackleton, Shackleton says, says, "Yes, take ahead. a nap. Take it. Take a forty-minute nap. Take or whatever a forty-minute nap." He wakes him up after and, five and minutes. Two minutes. Five minutes. Whatever it was. He said, "All right, guys, you've been sleeping for, for half forty an hour. minutes. Yeah, yeah, you're good to go." And they all believed him. Yeah. Yep. I love the stories because when he gets down there, the guy he already knows. He's already met, he already knows him, doesn't even recognize him as right. Ernest Shackleton. Yep. He says, mm -hmm. I know Ernest Shackleton, and that's not you. That's, yeah. yeah. This is this is this is the uh Can you the, imagine no years worth of beard and yes. black faces yes. because they're burning uh, uh, seal blubber. So this is the story of Guy Seger. <laughs> oh, this wow. is the same example of Guy Seger, he, the forgotten soldier. Right. He fights on the Eastern Front in Germany, Germany versus Russia, World War II. And he's hammered, right? He's hammered. He comes back. He, when he's finished with the war, he, he, he survives all of it. And his mother does not recognize him. When he shows up on his mother's doorstep right. in Alsace, in Alsace, his mother does not recognize him. Yeah. And if that's, uh, you know, and you're just, God bless, bro. Are yeah. you, you've been through so much hell yeah. that your mother doesn't recognize you. <laughs> this guy you just that. met a year ago yeah. doesn't recognize right. you. I wanted to do something bigger than myself, so I joined when I was 18, and that was in 1983. Uh, at the time, I was very fortunate. The Army was offering the 18 X-ray, or Special Forces Baby Program, so that's what I signed up for. I got hurt prior to that in jump school. I was a toad jumper. It pulled my bicep down into my forearm. I broke ribs, concussion, dislocated shoulder. Uh, which made it a little more challenging going through the SF course because it was physically challenging. Uh, for instance, if in order for you, you know one to uh, receive a hot A during first phase, you had to climb the rope and do 10 pulps with your kid on. And with one bicep, that was a little challenging. So I went hungry for a while. After the Special Forces course, I went up to uh, first group in Fort Lewis, Washington. And um, I was assigned to an A team there. Uh, I've spent about Three years there, was able to complete an, another Special Forces MOS, 18 Echo Communicator, and uh, go through both Halo and Scuba School. Uh, I was recruited from there for another unit that it, it was kind of riddled with ambiguity. I knew nothing about it. Uh, it was a Cold War job working out of Berlin. And uh, it was, in a nutshell, we were setting up networks for double agents out of Berlin. It was interesting in that we had, you know, good cover for action, cover for status. We were active in the uh, community. From there, I found myself into another unit working out of Soviet East Germany, and that was uh, spying on the Soviet Army. Real good job, and I was extremely fortunate to have been a part of that whole Cold War era. Once the, the Cold War dried up and, and the wall came down, uh, I tried out for the unit selection and finished off my career 
uh, 13 years in at the unit at Fort Bragg. I, I started there in about uh, 1991 and retired in 2005. Directly after I retired, I uh, landed a job with a corporation. Part of that corporation's job was to build the uh, Asymmetric Warfare Group, AWG. So I, I was uh, in charge of the training uh, for the AWG. I built a course called CAT-Z, Combat Application Training Course, and we would train uh, the Army in hopes to change as best we can the culture, the existing culture that the Army had. Yeah. Oh, you gotta get yeah, it. oh it's getting deep. But now. I but I thought it would be like pretty it. cool, you know, if we collabed and yeah. made these oh, yeah. specifically yeah, yeah, yeah. for cigars because I want my cigar to be up and down to yes. to savor the ash. Mm -hmm. I want right. I want a lot of ash, bro. And yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. I like some even, good ash. Tell, ash, tell me why. Right? Tell me why. Even if you tell me why. It the keeps heat. the heat, bro. Yeah. It, it keeps yeah. the heat. You know what? You know what I thought? So check this out. So uh two thousand I two thousand eleven, I'm training the Border Patrol down in El Paso. I come back from McGregor Base Camp at, to my Holiday Inn or whatever, and there's a pool out there. And I've got a cigar and a bourbon. And back then I was a rookie on both, 2011. And uh, there's three guys in the pool, three dudes. And they all have cigars and they're all smoking them like this. And the ashes are like this freaking long. And I asked them, they said, bro, we're Cuban. I said, so what? So, well, we know we know about we know cigars. <laughs> yeah. So and and then they took, they said, don't ash your cigar. Mm -mm. The keep, ash keep it number one, it, yeah. Number one, it's a it's a testament to the cigar, right? How e yeah, how okay. even is that burn? Number right. two, it keeps the heat in. But these guys were all walking around the pool. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I am an ash saver roar. I like to savor the ash. So downtown here in Aberdeen, <laughs> they had there was that uh, cigar bar in downtown. What's it called? Uh, Stand by. Uh, smoking. You and I have been smoking. there before. Smoking. And yep. they, they had a contest. Oh, ash contest. Uh, they've run the long So ash here's contest. what you got to do, right? <laughs> How is the humid on that cigar? I don't know. What is the cigar? Because yeah, yeah. you need to pick the right cigar for that. Yep. And the right humid. Right? So that shit's got to be at 70. Because you want oh, that yeah. slow burn, you know? Because if it's quick burn, you start to canoe. Oh yeah, you never know what's more of those. Who do you want? Oh, Hoodie these what? things. Man, you gotta bring those. those to me, dude. Are so you, you know what? No, no, no. You know what? Uh, so some chick at the pub, yeah, who knows me, said, "Oh, she went to some festival, and saw <laughs> this, these widgets, these yeah. figurines, <laughs> you know, and because um, they were like peace signs and yeah, thumbs yeah. up." Right. And she goes, "Oh, Mac would like this." So I just used to set it by my beer at the, like the pub, but then yeah. I realized, oh wait. I could lean my cigar against it, right. and then yeah. I went, wait a second, oh, boom, and you can put two of them next there. level. No, no, no. Yeah. That dude, one you goes need, you need to make, yes. have some of those made yeah. yourself. Yep. Well, I talked to this dude one. right here, right? Yeah. So I emailed him. Yeah. Apparently, he doesn't know who I am, bro, you know, because he just <laughs> totally know. freaking well, blew me off. Well, well. <laughs> he, must a, he must be a liberal. I could, yeah, I could make him yeah. a lot of money, bro. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, man. <laughs> the he the he didn't know who the fuck I am. <laughs> When I teach, I tell guys, I'm like, look, check here, you go at the door. Yep. I'm like, if you, there is no dumb question. Yeah. If you don't ask yeah, I've been asking a question, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, but if you are don't we, ask, are we, are we taping our know. targets again? Yeah. Well, not that.